Open up your Bibles, please, to John chapter 7. And we're going to read verse 1. The Lord Jesus Christ, He is going to one of the feast of the feast of the Jews. It's called the Feast of the Tabernacles. But He does not go immediately with the rest of the Jews. Instead, He delays and He goes to a different timing. If we look at verse 1, the Bible says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for He would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet Come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So as mentioned previously before, Jesus Christ, he's supposed to go to this Feast of Tabernacles, but he tells his brethren that I will not go. Now his brethren mocked him, saying, well, you're supposed to be the Christ that's supposed to perform miracles. Uh, why don't you perform a miracle? And Jesus Christ, he said that your time is always ready, but my time is not. And I think that is very eye-opening is that a lot of th times we think that God's time should be done at the right time, but what we mean by that is the right time is our time. Amen. And God's time never goes by our time. I know we're always ready. We want the answer to the prayer at this time. We want God to give us the victory over this situation at this time. But God's time is not your time. Your time is always ready, but that's not God's time. And one of the most frustrating things in life is when you're going through a painful trial and His time is not ready, whereas yours is. If you notice about God, He's the type of person that never rushes. And that's one of the most frustrating things about God. And that's the reason why I do prayers much earlier. You might say, why do you pray very early? Because I know how slow God is. So hopefully if I pray earlier, maybe the progress will be a little faster. Amen. But that's how the Lord works, is that He does things in time. In timing. Because His timetable is always better than ours. And in His timetable, He's trying to teach us something. In timing, He has a perfect plan set up. So then He must have things run on and on and on until it reaches at the right timing that his plan has set up at a perfect situation. So if you notice about our God, he's the type of person that always just lays back and let time flies. The title of my message today, which I hope you can do in your life, is Killing Time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, time will not take the advantage of us, but we'll be able to kill time itself. And that we'll be able to trust in you, wait on the Lord. And that's one of the most frustrating things in life. Help us to believe in you. And I pray that you'll fill within me Holy Ghost, unction, and power. Wash away my sins with your blood. For this sermon is full of weakness and in error without you. I pray that the people will get something out of this message. And all I can do is leave it in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, this ser sermon is pretty simplistic, so uh, may not mean much, but I hope it will help you because I know that a lot of people, they struggle with things, and this can be very beneficial to you. The first verse is, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, first, one of the first things that you might notice how the Lord Jesus Christ killed time and didn't go up to the Feast of Tabernacles is a very good reason. The reason is, is that if he went up, the Jews sought to kill him. So he had a very good reason why he shouldn't go at this timetable, but at a later timetable. 
He had a reason where he walked in Galilee and he did not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the reason why you should be abiding in Galilee and not go up to the situation where you want that answer right then and there, the result you want right then and there, the answered prayer and the victory right then and there, is because it's going to kill you. The, if, if the Lord truly answered the prayer that you want it to be done in your way of doing things, you know as well as I do that you would drop dead right on the spot. That your plan of doing things would spiritually hurt your life. That the Lord truly did your way of doing things that it would mo do you more harm than good. And when you saw the answered prayer and the Lord giving you victory at His timetable, it was at that time you understood why the Lord did it at a latter timetable. Why? Because He was trying to teach you something. Or if He did it earlier, it would have been a worse timing. But the point is, is that you will drop dead, you will be killed. If you can't kill time, time will kill you. And that's something important that you need to understand, is that time is not your master, it is not your maker. You have the victory against time itself. Why? Because you have the one who is in control of time inside you. You have the one who is without time who lives inside you. And that's what you need. You need to sink in. You need to become one with the person who is without time inside you and not let time dictate and control you. I'm not giving some kind of new age guru garbage. What I'm trying to tell you is that are, do you have a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as if you're sharing one mind with Him? And when you do that, you're able to kill time. You're able to let time fly and let everything just go to hell and just let God be in control. And you and Jesus are just walking in Galilee side by side. Are you taking time to enjoy fellowship with Jesus Christ? Are you lost in the presence of God? You know what Jesus did? He walked in Galilee. You know what I want to do? I want to go with the man, the stranger in Galilee. You ever heard of that hymn about the stranger in Galilee? That's Jesus Christ. You know what the people said about Jesus Christ out of mockery? This man came out of Galilee. No prophet rose out of Galilee. But I want to go to Galilee. I want to stay in Galilee. The verse says walked in Galilee. And that's important is your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Are you walking with Him? No, you let the job ruin you. You let the trials ruin you. You let pressures and burdens going on within your family life, within the church life, within your own problems in life dictate and run and control you. You're not taking time to just walk in Galilee with our Lord. If you don't walk in Galilee with our Lord, then you're going to get killed. Time's going to kill your life. It's going to kill your peace. Time is going to kill your joy. Time is going to kill your faith in the Lord. Time is going to kill your rest. And time is going to kill God's plan on how He's running things. Amen. You better not let the flesh dictate your life with the mind running a hundred billion imaginations and the heart running with a hundred billion different emotions and then the flesh running in a hundred different ways. And then when you go by the ways of the flesh, then it will kill you. That's right. But I am so scared that if God doesn't answer the prayer that I'm going to get killed. You know what you should be more scared about? That if you go your own way that you're going to get killed. That's what you should be more scared about. Amen. You should be more scared that um, going by your own way will kill you. That will drop you dead. There is no better safety and peace. And God will never take, uh, God will take better care of His children. There's nothing outside of His hand. Outside of His time and outside of His will. No matter what decision you make or wherever you go, and even with the mistakes that you make in your life, if you attempt to stay within God's hand, there is no better safety or peace to be in. Amen. Amen. No matter what decision you make. I don't care. I don't care what decision you make. I don't care how good your plan is. It will kill you one way or the other. Amen. And going God's way will not kill you. 
Oh, it does seem like it's going to kill you, right? It killed you financially. It kills uh, where things are going on, where you want them repaired, but it doesn't repair. So you're thinking that it is killing me, it is killing me, but if you go by your own way of doing things to repair the uh, broken areas, you're going to kill it even more. Kill time. Lay back and trust in Jesus Christ. If you don't, then you're going to get killed. Amen. Verse 2, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Now you notice the second point here, <clears throat> at verse 2 and 3, the feast of tabernacles is at hand. You'll notice at verse 3, Jesus' brethren said, Why don't you depart now and do your work and miracle? Prove that you are the Christ. But you know, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't depart out of Galilee, out of his timetable where the Father put him. He just stayed and walked in Galilee. He didn't depart. But it's at hand. It's time right now. But guess what? It's not God's time. It may be your time, but it's not God's time. You know when situations happen? I know when you want the answer prayer. I know uh, when you want the victory over your trial. And I know uh, that you need situations repaired. And it's not like you're an unreasonable person and you've been patiently waiting on the Lord. And you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. But now you've reached a time limit. And then you're thinking that it's at hand. And you're saying, Lord, do it now. But guess what? That's what the brethren did at verse 2 and 3. It was at hand, and the brethren said, Depart hence, do it now. But Jesus didn't do it. You know what you need to understand? Is that when the time is at hand, that doesn't mean God is at hand. God's timing at hand is different from your time being at hand. But it's my feast of tabernacles that's, it's, that's at hand. Jesus Christ needs to do the miracle now. Otherwise, it'd be too late. What's too late to God? He doesn't even know what that means. To you, it's too late, but never to God. And God says it's too late, then it's too late. You know, you've got to realize that uh, if God is the one in control of things at hand, don't you think that His hand is more powerful than the things at hand? <laughs> I'd rather stay at hand right here with Him rather than at hand with trial, sin, flesh, the world, problems in life. I'd rather stay at hand right here with Him. I'd rather walk in Galilee with Him. Hand in hand. Hold His hand and then just let it, when everything goes to hell, just hold His hand and say, God, you're in charge. Amen. Lord, I know that the world says it's at hand, that it's time right now. But God, you didn't say it's time yet. Let me just stay a little longer with you in Galilee. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. Amen. Where are you going? Where are you going? You've got to stay at hand with the. Uh, you got to stay at hand with the Lord, not be worried about other things going at hand. You know your problem is this: is that when you see things at hand, that's where you think that's when God moves. But you notice at verse two and three, that's not when God moved. At verse two and three, He just let it pass by. You think that God moves at right at the moments. At hand, where it's almost done. This is the limit. He must move in. But you got to think about this. Sometimes he doesn't. He just lets that time fly. Why? Because he has a better plan. If you tell the Lord, Lord, do it now, depart hence, then guess what? Then back to verse 1, you get killed. Do you trust in him no matter how... Do you really trust and believe in Him? You might say yes, but right when the trial is at hand, that's where it proves if you really trust Him or not. At hand moments. At hand crisis. And then you're like, I need an answer now. I need a response now. I need to do something now. It's at those moments that the Lord said, you still trust me? It's so easy to say, I trust God when everything's all right. When you still got time ahead. When you're one day before the answer that you need, it's easy to trust Him. And you do trust Him and you're patient, but not at those moments where it's at hand. You don't trust Him. Do you trust Him at hand? 
Verse 4. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. If you'll notice at verse 4 and 5, the brethren tell the Lord Jesus that, hey, no one does anything in secret. You should show it openly. You've got to show yourself to the world. Prove that you're the Christ. Do the miracles. But when they said those things, it's because it's not because they believed on Him. Lord, I believe in you. That's why you have to show the miracle now and show it off. No, it's because they doubted Him. They didn't believe in Him. Isn't that correct at verse 4 and 5? Why did the brethren say, do it now? Do the miracle now. Show it off to the world. You don't have to do it in secret. Show it off. It's important that you do that. You think they did that out of faith? No, they did that out of doubt. They did that because I highly doubt you can do the miracle. That's why. Why don't you do it now, huh? Show me. Prove it to me. Sometimes you don't wonder. Sometimes you don't realize that when you say, Lord, it is this important that you answer this prayer right now. It is this important that you give me the victory at this trial right now. It is very important that you show me something. And that you bring the fruit, you bring the result. Lord, I've labored for so long. I've waited on you. I prayed. So Lord, prove that you're God right now and do it so right now. Increase my faith. No, that's uh, you have little faith. That's the reason why you say those things. You doubt His power. Otherwise, why would you be saying those things? If you truly believed in His power... That whatever timetable he does things to answer your prayer, you wouldn't say those things. You would say, Lord, thy will be done. Lord, increase my faith. You don't have to prove it to me. You need to just increase my faith. I have doubt. Be honest. You have to be honest to the Lord. I know that the family crisis is this bad. The church crisis is this bad. The financial crisis is this bad. The health crisis is this bad. But what you need to learn and what you need to do is you need to have faith in the Lord. And if you claim that you have faith in the Lord but bad things happen and it didn't really work out, then the problem is, is that you don't actually have faith in the Lord. You know why? Because in verse 4, you're going by your expectations of what answers prayers are. You're going by your expectations of what good results are. That's your problem at verse 4. And if you go by that, then guess what? God will never answer the prayer. God will never answer it to your expectation. You know what God wants? God wants it where you truly trust Him no matter what the trial is, and that's where you attain true peace. Amen. You ever wonder why these Christians have such full peace when being burnt alive at the stake? How can they do that? That's mind-boggling. You know what that is? That's truly, truly just not caring what happens and truly not caring what step they take or what's going to happen literally or what pain they feel. They truly rely on God that, God, you're going to take care of me. Amen. God, whatever happens, happens. And there are accounts of those martyrs who did not feel pain when they got burned. You know what that is? Faith. Amen. That's faith. That's faith in the Lord. And you need to believe in God's way of doing things. When God doesn't answer to your expectation, does the things where you expect it to be, that's the reason why a lot of people end up as atheists. You know why? Because God was unfair to me in this life. That's why they end up in the liberal school education where it brainwashed them. You have to make a difference yourself. God can't make any difference for you. You know why they end up that way? They have their own expectation of how God should meet up their expectation. And when God lets them down on that, then they doubt Him. But guess what? Some of you are still in doubt. You're struggling with your faith. Because why? Because of verse 2 and 3, it's at hand. It's where you need the answer now. But remember this, true faith is during those at-hand moments. And do you still believe in Him? Or do you still doubt? It's okay to be honest with the Lord. Lord, I'm scared. Lord, I doubt. I'm not a champion of the faith. Be honest about it and pray it to Him. Don't be hypocritical and you know, try to tell the Lord and demand out of heaven that you need to do this now, Father. You have to take care of this situation or else, or else what? You're going to doubt God? 
You're going to run away from church? You're going to become bitter? What, you think you can threaten God? Don't you believe, verse 1, God's doing this to protect you so that you don't get killed? Sometimes he's doing that. By the way, sometimes going through death situation, going through killed, being killed situations, is what rescues you. It gives you life. Amen. Didn't you know that? You Amen. might say, how so? Jesus needed to die to raise himself from the dead, to give us all eternal life. Or we truly die in our sins and burn in hell. You want another example? The Bible says that we are killed all the day long. But guess what? We live unto Jesus Amen. Christ. And those martyrs died and lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus said? Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But after it dies, it brings forth much fruit. What does that mean? That means that until some situations truly get killed and die out, then the fruit can happen. Amen. You know what your problem is? You don't want to let those things die. You don't want to let those things get killed. You want to cling on to them. And God's like, how can I give you the fruit, child, if you still cling on to that thing? Why don't you let me kill it? Why don't you let me kill your pride? Why don't you let me kill your fleshly feeling? Why don't you let me kill some of the areas right here that needs killing? You're too comfortable right here. You need to learn something about reality here. You need to learn something about Christian living. You need to learn about dying to me. You need to learn about dying to the flesh and living unto the Spirit. You need to learn true peace. But to understand true peace, you need to go through death. That's what the Lord will do. You know what increases my faith so many times? That when my expectations get killed, God goes beyond my expectations. That's, when my, that's where faith truly comes in and I really believe in Him. That's why I believe in Him too. Uh, you know, during the coronavirus situation... In this liberal Bay Area, the online community where I'm under the attack and pressure. I mean, how is it that I can keep pastoring? And especially so many years as a single person. You know why? It's because I've seen too many. I've seen too many things of God pulling me out of death. I can't tell you how many times that I've died and God just resuscitated me back into life. I mean, he, he just put me in, he set my feet on higher ground, and then he gave me wings like eagles, and then he made me conquer death. He made me go above death. Why? Because I have the Savior who have the keys of death itself. Amen. But if he always rescued me on at-hand situations, if he always answered the prayers at my own timing situations, then guess what? Then all of my faith is just fleshly then. All it is is a faith that pleases my flesh and God goes at my whims. It's not a faith that's truly unto the Spirit. It's not a faith that goes beyond my flesh. It's not a faith that's truly pure and holy of God. It's only of my own. What real faith is? Where God has my flesh killed. And it's not to my expectations at verse 4. And that's where I believe in Him. Verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. I think that's a good verse to memorize there. Verse 7, He explains it more. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now that should be very enlightening to you. If you look at verse 6, Jesus says, My time is not come here, but your time is always ready. Now, uh, what did that mean? So I did not understand what it means. So I looked at the original Greek and the original Hebrew, and then it just made me more confused, actually. So I thought, so then I tried to compare it with the NIV and the ESV, and I thought it would give me light, but it just didn't help me so much. So then, uh, to my shock, when I read the modern Bible versions, it actually showed that Jesus was a liar in that passage. Now you might say, well, how so? Because if you read verse 8, notice your King James Bible says, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up, what? Yes. Yet unto this feast. Why did, Jesus say, why did Jesus say, I'm not going yet to the feast? Because he did go later on at verse 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. See that? He went to the feast. That's why Jesus said, I'm not yet going to the feast. But... You know what your modern Bible versions do? 
what they did was is that they dropped the word yet at verse 8. They said that Jesus said at verse 8, Go ye up unto this feast, I go not unto this feast. But then he lied then at verse 10. He went up unto the feast. How about that? Your God's a liar. Your God's a liar. So, you know, I, th I was like, but I thought that James White's book, King James Only Controversy, and John Ankerberg on his show, that, you know, the modern Bibles were okay, but so it just made me more confused. So then I was like, Lord, I mean, I need an answer to this. I do not, un do not understand what it means here. And so I turned to my final authority, Peter S. Ruckman, in his commentary. And I was looking at his explanation, and I was like, oh, Lord, there's so much light over here. And then he gave me some answers, but, you know, it was not truly my final authority. And I was like, oh, you know, I think I idolized the man too much. So then I went to the verse again at verse 6 and 7. And the Bible always interprets it for you. And Dr. Ruckman did mention this part, is that at the part of verse 6, My time's not yet come, but your time is always ready. In other words, you always have your time ready. You think you're ready, you're done, and that you can do it. But that's not God's timetable because verse 7 is the key. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He meant by your time is always ready in the worldly sense. See? The world's time is always instantaneous. It is always readied. It always wants to do things. But that's not God's timing. You know what that is? That is fleshly. There was a person in my church that I always respected, but he always talked about instant gratification is of the flesh. That's how he termed it as, instant gratification. Instant. Why? We're an instant people. We need something right now. We need the connection going right now, technology-wise. You know, a shorter travel distance. Something right now, right now. We're bound by this flesh. And you have to understand, that is the world. Are you of the world? No, pastor. I'm trusting in the Lord, and I'm trying to wait on the Lord, and etc. My friend, the devil's job is where you lose your patience so that you can understand, the f so that you can share the same feeling as the world does. Lord, I want it my time. I need it now. And he wants you to fall into that worldly sensation. You know what that, those feelings are? That's worldly. That's worldly. Look, I understand sometimes you're going through a death-defying situation, and I can't just blame you for that. But you know what the scriptures say? And this is not Gene Kim. You know, Gene Kim, he'll be the one who'll pray for you. He'll feel sorry for you. And then he'll try to comfort you. But I'll tell you what the scriptures will say. The scriptures will say, you know, the world hates it. And you're just like the world. That's what the scriptures will tell you. The scripture says, you know, the world hates God's timetable. They want something instantaneous. Are you of the world, child? That's what God's going to ask you. And how are you going to answer? You know, I'll be honest to the Lord in my prayer. Lord, I just hate your timetable. And I need something. I, this is very important. I'm going through sleepless nights. And I just want this resolve put behind me. And then the Lord, he'll teach me, uh, yep, I know that you hate it. But that's what the world does. And I want you to truly have the world crucified unto you. And then what I say is, okay, Lord, then you just need to give me grace. And God's like, about time you ask for the right prayer request. You need to keep praying to the Lord. You need to keep being honest to the Lord and tell Him your emotions and what you're struggling with. And the more that you pray, the, Lord, the more the Lord will show you things. You know what you need to do? You need to do verse 1. You need to walk in Galilee. You need to read that book. You need to keep going to church. You need to fellowship with the brethren. You need to hear spiritual counsel and help. And you need to pray to the Lord. You need to keep doing these things so that the Lord can show you more answer and more answer that you're missing out on. Why? Because if you don't go walk in Galilee, if you don't do your Bible reading, your prayer, you go to church, you go to soul winning, you spend time with the brethren, you ask for spiritual counsel, you hear preaching and teaching, if you don't do those things, then where else, is, where else can you go besides Galilee? The world. It's all open out there. It's all open. Just one step out of Galilee, you're automatically in the world's terrain. 
Because why? The world is such a big place. You're in the world, but you're not supposed to be of the world. So be careful when you go one, st one foot out of Galilee. Do not step one foot out of Galilee. When you step one foot out of Galilee, you're automatically following the world's pattern of thinking. What is the world's pattern of thinking when problems happen? I need to drink. I need to sin. I need to go by psychologists and seek their advice. You know, those liberal professors, they provided these solutions. I don't know why I never did those things before. You know, uh, I, the world told me to do this and to do that. And, you know, they're not Christians, but, you know, they're okay. And they have a point over here. And then, you know, I've seen some things work with them. See, that's what happens when you have one foot out of Galilee. You start to see logic within the world, you start to make sense of the things of the world. Why? Because your mind is becoming of the world. You need to get out of the world. You know why? The world hates God's ways of doing things. You know what I would, the first step to get out of the world is honest recognition. Lord, I hate your timing. I'm of the world and I'm just wicked, Lord. So you need to show me grace and mercy and be understanding and help me out over here. And the Lord's like, well, about time you admitted that. You thought that you were strong enough to endure through the trial, huh? You thought that you knew it all, huh? You thought that you had faith in me, but in your heart of hearts, you realize that you're just weak and hopeless and you wanted help. Amen. About time you got honest with me, child. About time you realized the desperation of it, that you're praying every night, that you're fasting and that you're weeping. About time you recognized how serious it is. Remember, the world hates it. And you know what God's job is? It's to testify of it and to expose the works thereof are evil. That's God's job. You know what God's job is when he's going by his timetable? To expose how evil and how uh, fallacious and how weak and how horrible the ways of the world are. So what's God doing with you in the trial? He's trying to expose to you the ways of the world, that it's evil, that it's wrong. And that it's not the way to go. You know what he's trying to do with you right now? He's trying to expose the evil. Trying to testify against it. And what you need to do is, if you want to follow the mindset of God in His timetable, rather than the mindset of the world in their timing, in their instant gratification, in their me, me, now, now moment, in order to not fall for this mindset, but to follow the mindset of Jesus Christ in His timetable, what is Jesus Christ's mindset? I hate the world. The patterns of the world. But right here, you're going into the world and you're saying, you know, I st I'm starting to love the things of the world. I'm starting to believe some of the things in the world. I'm starting to cling on to some of the things of the world. You know what? I'll just be honest. Years later, I love the world more than God. And God wants you to get out of that. How do, I, how do you get out of that? Start hating the world. When you start hating the world, you go more by God's thinking and timetable. You know, I hate how weak my flesh is, Father. I hate the instant gratification of my flesh. I hate how people uh, provide a solution and they seem attractable to me rather than your word. I hate it that I cannot believe in you, Father. I hate it that I cannot have joy and peace in you through the trial. Lord God, I hate it. And if you start to have that emotion of hate against the world, the flesh, and the devil, how can sin triumph against you? Amen. You know why sin became attractable to you? And you need to hate that sin. And you need to say, God, I hate living uh, through sleepless nights and always worrying and being fearful. I hate this emotion, Father. Amen. I love peace. I love joy. I love your timetable. Father, please help me out over here. And the Lord, He's going to give you that grace to bear through another night. The Lord's going to give that answer prayer when you need it. The Lord's going to work out a, a situation. Where somebody might give spiritual counsel. There might be a sermon. There might be an eye-opening moment where the Holy Spirit might just speak to you invisibly. And then you get that victory. And then you get the answer prayer. And then you get the peace that you need. Amen. Hate the world. Hate fear. Hate worry. Hate your way of doing things. Hate your flesh. And, and start to fall in love with verse 1, where you walk in Galilee with Him. 
where you start to love that voice, peace be still, in the middle of the storm. Where you start to uh, love that shed blood in the midst of death, in the midst of death on the cross of Calvary, that you love that shed blood that washed away your sin. Start to love Romans 8, 28, when bad things happen and fail your expectation. Amen. And you love the promise of Romans 8, 28. Amen. Start to love the promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where God says, My grace is sufficient for thee, and Amen. I will give you grace to go through the trial. Start to fall in love with that first in the midst of where the flesh feels like it's going to die out. And you love the grace that He's pulling you through. Start to fall in love with what God says that he makes all things beautiful in his time and start to believe and fall in love with that verse and then you start to hate about your timing of doing things and then you amend your prayers and then you amend your thinking you amend your ways and you say God I love your time not my time because my time is going to kill me and I hate that father I hate it to the core start to fall in love what God said that my God shall provide all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Start to fall in love where He's providing you the needs currently right now in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the trial. And start to count all the blessings and the riches that He gave to you. And then you start to enjoy and fall in love with, thank you, Heavenly Father, for a home. Thank you, Father, for a family. Thank you, Father, for a church that loves and cares for me. Thank you, most of all, that you love and care for me. Thank you so much, Father, that your promises are true, that there are these blessings I can hold on to. Start to fall in love with those things in the middle of depression, in the middle of worry, in the middle of fear, in the middle of everything turning against you. Start to fall in love with walking in Galilee with Him rather than the world's way of peace, the world's way of joy. Because Jesus said, peace I leave unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. That's what Jesus said to you. Verse 8 says, Go ye up unto this feast, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now did you notice that verse 8? His timing is not yet full come. Sometimes there's a thing which you never heard about before, where uh, God has his uh, direct will, his perfect will set up, but then he has a permissive will. And what that means is this, is that sometimes the Lord will allow and give permission on some things to happen, but that's not his perfect full will that he wants. You know what the problem with you is that if you're not careful, if you're at that place where, well, God, you know, um, I want my way of doing things, and I'm in desperation here, and Father, you need to go by my timetable, and if that's how you come out with your request to the Lord, guess what? The Lord can give it to you. You know what God said at verse 8? Go ye up unto this feast. That's what he said. Okay, go ahead then. Go to the feast. That ain't my way of doing it. You can go up. And not only that, you notice that the next part of verse 8, it says, my time is not yet full come. Sometimes the Lord can be so gracious and good to you and allow, give permission to answer the prayer request, allow and give permission to give you the desire that you want, allow and give permission to help you. Why? Because He wants you happy. He doesn't want you miserable. And He can see that, you know, that, look, uh, I'm going to give something to this child. Because this child is probably going to throw a tantrum or become an atheist or God forbid what's going to happen. So I think I'm, I'm going to do something, grant permission. It's not my perfect will. It's not what uh, I had a better expectation and plan for this child. But if the child doesn't really want it, then uh, I'll, just, I'll do it then. I'll do it. I'll just grant the person permission. Go ye up unto this feast. You can go. You can go ahead. But it's not my full perfect will. My time is not yet full come. I would like to ask you this question. In the middle of the road, you have two things. Do you really want, uh, do you really want God's full plan and purpose and blessing that He promised would be beautiful and be beyond expectation and help you in your life? A joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Do you want the full timing of it or do you want not his full timing of it. Just his partial plan. Just his partial will. Just his partial blessing. I think, mo uh, I think, which is sad, most of you want that. What you want is your own blessing 
and some of God's blessings. You don't want to empty yourself of your own blessings and have all of God's blessings. Did that make any sense? You know, the problem is, is that you, it's truly what the verse is. Uh, no man can serve two masters. And you're clinging on to the world and to God. That's why Jesus Christ says at verse 6 and 7, that pattern of thinking is truly the world's, their timing of things. Do you truly want God's full blessing? If I were you, I'd, uh, I'd probably go on my knees and say, God, I want your full blessing, but man, it's so difficult. My flesh is so weak and I'm horrible and I want to go by my timetable. I want your full blessing, Father. Give me your full blessing, Heavenly Father. But I'm weak and I'm frail and you need to help me and you need to do something about it. And the Lord says, I'll help you. You have the right thinking this time, you have the right heart this time, and you have the right prayer this time. You know why God, uh, a lot of times God doesn't go answer your prayer or help you out with the situation until you change yourself until you have the, truly the right heart, truly the right thinking, and truly the right words to pray. Truly the right atti attitude. Mm -hmm. You think you did, but after hearing this preaching, you're starting to see a little bit more that there's something of the flesh, partial of the world that you're still clinging on to, aren't you? Let it go. You know, the martyrs, they let go of wife and children. You know, there were... Uh, People, Christians throughout time, that were willing to leave their homeland and become a lonely missionary in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because they wanted the full blessing of God. And by the way, you know, it's not as horrible and gloomy as you think. When God gives you His full blessing, you'd be surprised. It can be something where you have a big ministry. It could be where the family gets resurrected and restored, like Job, right? But they had to die first, right? Uh, it could be where God doubles uh, your riches or your portions later on in life. It can be physical riches. You'd be surprised how truly gracious and good God is to you. The problem is, is that you always never believed Him to be that gracious and good to you. God knows your emotion. God knows what's the true desire, the right desire that will truly make you happy. You just don't believe in Him, do you? He knows truly what makes you happy, truly what makes you sad. Sometimes he knows that some of those old joys that you have, they need to be changed because they're not true joys. And that happened to me. I, I didn't realize that some of my old joys that I clung on to, that I had to let it go, and then the Lord replaced it with a new joy, which I found to be much better than my old. Uh, you ever seen those uh, babies or those children, you know? They love their toys. And then when they reached uh, 12 years old, they should be a little bit old enough by now, or 13, that you should let those toys go. No, I love the toy that much, you know, I want to keep playing with it. But then they start to realize how, you know, immature and childish that could be, and they start to let those things go, right? You know, uh, you're not watching Barney and Teletubbies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or Sesame Street. I mean, come on, you know. Desires change. Desires change. You have an immature thinking with your old joy. You got to think about what God knows your growth, where you're heading toward, and what would make you really happy. Let his full blessing fall upon you, not a partial. You're still, how many of you are still clinging on to a partial blessing and not letting it go? Uh, verse 9 and 10 and that's my point here, which brought up to my previous point. You'd be surprised how good God is to you. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. You know what the funny thing about the Lord is? Is that sometimes the Lord will give you those old joys. The Lord will give you uh, those fleshly, quote unquote, fleshly desires and riches. Notice that the Lord, he did go up, right? But it was just not at the right time. And notice he did it in secretly, not openly. You know what God tends to do when he does his plan and way of doing things? Is that he didn't promise you a life full of sun, sunshine and roses uh, on the path that you tread. And they'll meet all your expectations. He never promised that. But you'd be very surprised when he does it in secret. Where you least expect it that he gives you that path of roses. And he gives you a life full of sunshine. 
You'd be very surprised. You say, why is that? Because God wants to see the world die first. The flesh die first. The self die first. He wants to see you truly believe that he'll give you the joy that you need. Amen. He wants to see that first before he gives you the joy. Before he gives you the blessing. And he wants, and he does things outside of your expectation. That's when I start to learn to give up. On, you know, the thing is, is that you always have this fantasy that at the very last prayer meeting, Lord, Lord, I need an answer by tomorrow. And then you have this fantasy that the Lord will answer your prayer. And then you're going to give a testimony Wednesday night. The Lord answered my prayer. We all go, hey, man, God bless you, brother. And, yeah. sister, and then we start weeping and stuff like that. And those are great things. Those are good things. But, Amen. you know, but also, that's just a fantasy as well. It's such a fantasy that you think that the Lord, uh, and that's the, day, that's the thing, the Lord doesn't go by your expectations, your thinking. He does it in secret. Why? Your God likes surprises, in case you didn't know. <laughs> your God is a God full of surprises. He wants to say, happy birthday, and make it truly a joyous occasion for you. But it's not really a happy birthday if you already spoiled the gift and gave them an idea what the gift is. And the Lord, He wants to give you a happy birthday. He wants to give you a good gift. And He, uh, he does things outside of your expectation. Why? Because He wants you to truly rely on His way of doing things, not you relying on your expectations and your plans and your way of doing things. Amen. So one thing I've learned when I go through a trial is give up thinking. I just gave up thinking. I was like, Lord, you're going to do something. That's it. And God's like, isn't that simple faith? Yeah, Lord, but I don't like it, but sure. Yeah, all right, simple as that. All right. And I was like, okay, good. About time you learn. That's how simple faith is, all right? You always want to jump the gun. You want to go from A to Z, but no, child, go back to A and B and C and you said E and then God's like, no, 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 you skip D. Let's go back again. A, B, C, and E, Lord. No, 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 go back again. A, and B, and E, Lord, E, right now, E. And God's like, uh, A. <laughs> Say A. A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F, G, G, H, H, I, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, B. You're such a wonderful God. W, X, Y, N, O, a Z. Our God is an awesome God. Isn't that the Christian attitude in life normally? Simple faith. I want to close it off right here. Is that he? That's where he does it, not in the open, in secret. And you're looking at the wrong places. You know, there's a, a passage where Elijah tried to find the Lord, and then the Bible says the Lord was not in the earthquake, public. He was not in the fire, public. He was secret, a still small voice in the cave. You know what your problem is? You keep looking at the fire. You keep looking at the earthquake. And that's what Peter's problem was, is that he looked at the winds and the waves when he tried to walk on the water. You know what they weren't looking at? They weren't looking at the secret place, the private place. You know what your problem is? You're, if you done, you know what the point is? Is that if you just believed verse 1, I would not have preached verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. I did not have to preach that. If it, you just had simple faith at verse 1, just walk in Galilee. The still small voice in the cave. Are you still searching, finding it? Are you trying to hear that voice? Or are you hearing your own voices? So many voices. The conscience, the, the heart, and the feeling saying, right now, you're going to die, and this is the end. And how many voices are you hearing? Can't you, can't you hear the still small voice that says, be still and know that I am God. 
Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call Amen. is open. Uh, if the Lord laid upon your heart, you can come to the altar's floor over here, or you can pray in your seats however way the Lord dealt with you. I don't know what you're going through right now, but you need to go to Galilee. You're in the world. Some of you are like 500 miles away from Galilee, and you're in the world. Walk back. Go back. Go back to Galilee and walk with him there. Stay there. He does things uh, where we, it's always, always the Lord does things that's uh, not our expectations. That's his way of doing things. It's his voice, the still small voice. If you keep trying to find your own way of doing things, the world's way of doing things, or your perception of how God should be doing things, then I guarantee you this, is that you're going to kill yourself. At verse 1. You're going to miss the still small voice. I know you don't like the still small voice, but you need to hear that. Well, you're looking at the wrong places. God is not in the earthquake. God is not in the fire. God is that still small voice in the cave. You need to listen to his voice. But you forgot to listen to his voice. You don't spend time hearing his voice, seeking his voice. Just staying there with him. I don't hear God, Pastor. See, you're expecting something loud, a fire, and an earthquake, an answer. No, it's what you've always been doing. Go to church. Claim the promises of his word. Read the Bible. Pray. And check your heart if there's something of the world that did not die. Hate the world. Be honest with him and give it to him in prayer. Start to hate the world and love the things of the Lord. His promises will ring more true to you when you hate the world even more, when you see how weak and pale the world is. Life comes after death. It's after death. Not right before death. It's after death. Life comes. And you need to cling on to that precious hand of the shepherd. The, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God, my Father, I pray that today's preaching has helped where we trust in your timetable, that we wait on the Lord, and that uh, we just walk in Galilee with you. This has not been a very st stirring or mind-blowing sermon. It's just very simplistic. But it's the simple things that we miss out. All we need is verse 1 from today's preaching. We didn't need 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Sometimes we humans are so complicated and complex that we need all 10 verses, Lord. I pray that um, you'll please help us to go back to verse 1. And that's where we will be and stay there. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.